Hey, Michael. Hey, how's it going so far? So far, so good. <laughs> Just the two of us. The early birds. The early birds. Hey, apologize for the, the associate dean thing. Oh, no worries. I was able to fix the PDF, but um, Mackenzie hasn't been able to get that up on the website yet. Uh, ah. we're, we've got a <laughs> big conference starting tomorrow, and I think she's just... Yeah, no worries. Yeah. I figured if it was easy to do, you know, otherwise, I'm still me. Yeah. Was that a, was that a recent... Um, um, our associate Dean is about a year or so, a little more than a year ago now. So not that recent. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Thank folks. Thanks, thanks for joining. Uh, hey, Erin. Oh, um, I'm here. Sorry. Hello. You. Thank you. That's OK. Um, I'm just going to try to get some uh, odds and ends set up here. OK. Oh, good. I do that. I was able to set up that poll question in advance. That worked. And let me uh, get my slides going here. One thing that would be great, Aaron, um, as every every minute or two <laughs> for, the, for the beginning, if you don't mind reposting the link to the Google Slides for folks uh -huh. who join later. Got it. Because they otherwise wouldn't see that link. Okay. Are they in chat now or have you not? not well, probably yet. not yet. Getting okay. That right now. I'm just saying sure. that anyone with the link in view, perfect. Copy and chat. Okay. I'll repost that every few minutes. That's great. Now let me just get my windows set up just right. Okay, it looks good to me. I'm seeing it. Yeah. Mm hmm. Great. Had to do a little bit of window calisthenics here, but <laughs> glad it's working. How many monitors do you have going on over there? I've been able to, I figured out how to do it on one finally. Okay. Okay. I had, I have the second computer mm -hmm. and um, I know I, I, I teach an online course for teachers on how to teach online courses mm -hmm. and found myself using two computers a lot for teaching the course and then realized what kind of an example am I setting? <laughs> if I can't make it work on a single screen, uh, you know, I can see that. so, so I, I sort of challenged myself to, um, be able to use common, like, you know, using Google Slides, which is ubiquitous, and doing it in a way where um, I can still have some of the presenter view things that show me how much time has gone by, what my next slides are, 
see my speaker notes if I have any, mm -hmm. and, but then share just the portion of the screen that is the slides. So yeah, I'm proud of figuring that out. That course that you teach is desperately needed. I know that uh, my children's teachers during remote school had more than one screen. And usually it's because they had uh, their own screens that they could bring to the process. So they had one from school and one from home, which yeah. I know is not true all over. Yeah, I much prefer having multiple screens. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also aware, like when I'm talking to the teachers that, so for example, one thing I commonly do is on my, I have my, my laptop here on a little stand. So I would have my uh, roster for the course there and some additional notes. And so, but when I'm, when I'm attending here, you guys are looking at me thinking, I don't know, where he's watching TV. What's, what the heck's he doing? <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, you know, I found it important to let people know sometimes well, how, my, how my desktop is laid out so that you know when I'm here, I'm actually, I could be totally paying attention and involved. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but yeah, the importance of make, being explicit about things like that. And, and mm -hmm. even now, like with a very large screen, like right now I'm looking at the bottom of my slides that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the logo in the bottom left-hand corner. You know, probably looks like I'm asleep because I'm looking so far down. Uh -huh. um, I see. Yeah, I think about this stuff too much. It's the neuroscientist background, visual <laughs> neuroscientist. I think about this stuff way too much. But what kind of communication are we sending? Like, so, and so one way I can figure that out is I'm dragging the video screen from Zoom, which includes my image, down to the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. So now mm -hmm. I now can see what it looks like for you all when I'm looking at the bottom of my slides. Mm -hmm. It looks like I'm asleep. And, and yet looking at the little dot for your camera is so unnatural at times, you know? Yeah, I try to keep the, um, the video up near the camera mm -hmm. for that reason. And I'm thinking about technologies that are sorely needed as a way of me to seem like I'm looking at you via the camera, even when I, you know, like, so Erin, like if you're right now in the middle of my screen, you're, you're dead center mm -hmm. in the middle of my screen. When I'm talking to you and I'm looking at your face, it does not look like I'm looking at you. Right. And so we can learn that to some extent, but I think that there are just some fairly hardwired processes in our brains that if somebody's not looking at us, it's hard to believe that they're looking at us. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kristen. Hey, yeah, I'm just moving. Hi, Kristen. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for joining. I'm excited. I um, I don't have any slides. I've never. I mean, I'm just. We're just talking. <laughs> I'm just talking. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Thank yeah. you so much for sending that publication that you authored. It's such a great publication. I really am, am thank you for sharing it. I, oh, I thought to myself, where's this paper been all my life? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so well written and clear. Yeah. You know, it, it, I've been really wanting ever since first working on that, to, I knew it was a first stab at this it really needs to be looked at again. We've all learned so much. UDL has changed. The technologies have changed. Um, it needs a major refresh. And I keep trying to find projects I can piggyback that effort on. And um, it's hard because it does require, it's, it's a, it, there was a lot of work putting that stuff together. Those guidelines, yeah. Thanks for joining, Don. Hey. I'm here. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, Hanging in there. Yeah. And welcome to everybody. Um, we did have about 75 people sign up for this talk. So I'm hoping the floodgates just open in the next 20 seconds. Uh -huh. um, and also that our other speaker joins, our other panelist joins. Um, so just hang on everybody. Oops, Let's see if I can move. Looks like Jennifer's on. Oh, good. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry, there are a lot more people than I realized. I was, 
Uh, this is great. Thanks for joining, Jennifer. We're gonna get started in a few minutes. We, Bob, would it be interesting if people put their affiliations in the chat so we know who we got? That's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, folks, participants here, um, if you don't mind just putting in the chat. And for all those participants, for all those participants who are already here, we have posted a link to the slides and I'll continue to post that link periodically until we think everyone is here with us today. Hey Bob, the uh, participant ta participants tab is active, so you can see everybody on. Yes, thanks, Richard. Yeah, I see that now. And just as an aside to Aaron and our panelists, I've made you all co-hosts. So you can have fun with Zoom if you'd like. In case <laughs> any of you do have anything you wanna share uh, from your screen, you can do that. All right, it's, it's about three minutes after two uh, Eastern time. And we've got about 30 participants, 31 participants. Let, let's get started. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, this is our first of many panel discussions and webinars in our series. Uh, this is exploring whether universal design for learning can promote assessment fairness and equity. Thanks for joining. Um, we've got a couple hours. So we can kind of luxuriate into some really quality in-depth discussion here. We're gonna start off with some welcome and introductions. Uh, and then uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about the organizing group that's setting up this, this uh, panel discussion, the Assessment and Measurement SIG or Special Interest Group within the UDL IRN. I'll explain all these acronyms when we get to it. And then, I'm gonna spend about 20 minutes or so just kind of setting the table for us and talking about what do we mean by universal design? What do we mean by universal design for learning? And how have each of these been applied to assessment? There's a big difference here and there's a lot of confusion about it. So I'm just gonna kind of set us all so we're all on the same page about this. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron who is going to be facilitating the panel discussion itself. Okay, so that's the plans. Um, as means of welcome and introduction, um, I'm gonna have the three panelists each introduce themselves. Jennifer, do you wanna start? Sure, thank you, Bob. Um, I'm Jennifer Randall. Um, associate professor in the measurement program at UMass. Um, that feels like enough. <laughs> uh, I'll pass it on. J Jennifer, I, I don't mean to put you on the yeah. spot or anything, but is there no. a family member you want to talk about? Oh, oh, <laughs> sure. 
completely related to what we're talking about today, Absolutely. not really. Um, please cheer on my daughter, Gabby Thomas, who is um, in Tokyo right now, getting ready to compete in the Olympics in the 200 meter relay and the four by 100 meter relay. So, Woo-hoo. yeah, that's exciting. I don't know how, about how other people feel, but I, I just feel like, wow, I'm in the right place at the right time with the right person. Just, just hearing that, that's, that is cool. Proud, proud mom. Um, thanks, Jennifer. Kristen? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to Bob and Aaron and uh, Molly for inviting me to participate in this uh, esteemed panel. And um, uh, uh, really um, important this discussion. Um, my name is Kristen Hoff. Um, I have been at Curriculum Associates running the assessment and research program for a little over five years. Uh, I am a proud graduate of um, UMass and uh, so uh, really grateful to be here with um, Jennifer and um, Michael and, and you, Bob and Aaron. Great. Thanks, Kristen. And Michael. Yeah, thanks. I'm Michael Rodriguez. I am a professor of educational measurement at the University of Minnesota and newly appointed dean of the College of Education and Human Development. Uh, not part of the grand plan, but happy to step up uh, and take a new leadership role. And also uh, appreciate the opportunity and the invitation. Uh, really enjoyed my work with Kristen and Jennifer on uh, on a, on a panel over the last year that Kristen pulled together and looking forward to talking about this uh, with UDL. Excellent, thanks, Michael. Yeah, we're, we are really lucky to have the three of you today. Thank you for your generous time. Um, and Erin, do you wanna introduce yourself? Erin um, and, and Don also, I'm glad you could make the call. Erin, um, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Erin Lomax. I am a senior research associate at Westat, and my role is really to support the SIG. My background is mostly in assessment of special populations, kids with disabilities and English learners, and I spent some time in education assessment policy, which is also interesting to see how these children are included in assessment and accountability systems. So I offer a different lens while I'm moderating today and I'm very much looking forward to it. Don? I'm off of mute now. I'm Don Barfield. I'm an Associate Director at Westat, uh, uh, focusing on assessment work, evaluation work. Uh, I've worked as a, a, a Assistant Superintendent in School District in testing and evaluation to working at Harcourt assessment when it was Harcourt assessment before it became Pearson. I've uh, been involved in a, just a range of assessment related work. Uh, and this is just a fantastic opportunity and, and a good time to be uh, looking at this issue right now. So looking forward to the discussion. That's great. And I'm Bob Dolan. Um, I'm the founder and president of Diverse Learners Consulting and a senior innovation scientist at CAST. Um, my background is actually in neuroscience, but I've been in the field of education, technology, research, and innovation for about 20 years now, focusing a lot on assessment. Uh, I started at CAST and uh, spent a lot of years at Pearson in the measurement group there, and uh, been consulting and just returned to CAST part-time a few years ago. Uh, so I'm real excited uh, to be with you all today. Um, so let me talk just really briefly about who we are here. So um, Don and Aaron and I are representing the special interest group called Assessment and Measurement, which just formed within the UDL IRN, Universal Design for Learning Innovation and Research Network. So UDL IRN formed a few years back as, a way, as kind of a grassroots effort to bring together and form these networks of folks who can do the deep, the deep dives in UDL, helping understand it, helping figure it out, helping promote it, um, helping continue research on UDL, additional applications. Um, and there's been a few special interest groups that have formed, this being one of the most recent. Uh, we formed a couple of months ago, 
Uh, but this is kind of our kickoff because we realized that in just forming a special interest group, yeah, we got some people signing up, but what does it mean? So this is what it means. Events like this, where we can get some really great minds together and really have some great hard discussions, tough questions. So our mission specifically is to support, and this is the mission of the special interest group, is to support collaborative research on UDL in approving, improving assessment and measurement of diverse learners, on effective applications of UDL principles during assessment design and development, and also the development of new measures to evaluate the impact of UDL on student learning. One of the big questions, and I don't know if we'll end up touching on it or not now, people ask about UDL, how do we know UDL works? The other SIGs are looking at that too. Everyone who knows anything about UDL should be thinking about this. Hey, UDL sounds good, but how do we know it works? Well, we can have a role in that. We wanna have a role in that as well in terms of the development of new measures. Our vision is to uh, have all education stakeholders understanding, creating, and having access to high quality assessment and measurement tools and practices that, that can be used for both summative and formative purposes and that accurately and fairly reflect diverse learners, okay? Including, but not limited to students with disabilities. And for those of you who know CAST and UDL, you know that that's where the roots of Universal Design for Learning comes from. And UDL is really all about improving learning opportunities for all students. Um, any questions before I move on to just set up that foundation and Universal Design ideas? I should mention a couple of logistics. One is, uh, folks, please, I think everybody's already muted if you're not talking. Um, if you do wanna talk, if you do wanna communicate, you can use the chat. Aaron and I are kind of taking turns of monitoring the chat when the other one is talking. And uh, when we get to the questions and answers period, you'll be invited to unmute yourselves if you do have a question. Um, also, this session is being recorded. Uh, I want to make sure everybody knows that. I think Zoom probably already told you that. Uh, any other logistics, Aaron, that I missed? Okay, very good. Yeah, and as Aaron says, feel free to post comments and questions in the chat. Super. And just as an aside, this is kind of a meta thing. We could have set this up as a webinar, but we intentionally set it up as a Zoom meeting, hoping for more participation, more, act, more active participation uh, by you participants. So please make use of it. All right, thanks. So universal design, universal design for learning and assessment. Um, I'm gonna reset my timer here and really try to keep it to 20 minutes because I really wanna get to the panelists. So I'm gonna start off with a poll. I often use this poll when I'm talking about UDL because it's amazing how the answers have changed over the years. So I'm going to create this, I'm going to launch this poll. And there's six, there's one question with six, it's multiple choice, single, single answer, multiple choice. What do you know about universal design for learning? Never heard of it, heard of it, but don't know what it is. Have a basic idea of what it is. Have a solid understanding of UDL. Could write a book on it have written a book on it. And by book, I will accept a chapter or journal article. Answers are coming in. I'm impressed we have folks who have written a book on it. It's a good sign. Oh, you all are. You all can view the, uh, the responses. Okay, good. In the past, you could only view the responses once they all came in, but that's great. Yeah. We've got 89% uh, voting here. This is good. So what we're seeing here is that getting near half of the people have a basic idea of what it is, that's great. Uh, there's a few people who've heard of it, don't know what it is. I, I, I won't be completely filling you in on what it is, but giving you a good start. And for those of you who have a solid understanding of it and could write, could write a book and have written a book on it, 
we want to we actually want to hear from everybody and sometimes the questions coming from the folks who are first learning about what udl is are the most important questions to ask there are no dumb questions seriously okay great thanks folks appreciate your input on this um but i'm going to start by talking about universal design universal design is a concept that started in the early 1990s from ron mace at north carolina state university an architect and a professor he himself a wheelchair user. He had this philosophy that you know, so often when you think about wheelchairs for as an example, we don't consider how somebody in a wheelchair can get into a building or out of a building until after the building is built. And we come up with these retrofits that, that suck. They're, they're too steep, they're too narrow, too twisty turny, they're ugly, they're too expensive. So, so what would it be like if we thought about the multiple ways in which people can use spaces and even physical devices from the outset. That is the concept of universal design. The central tenets of it are that one size doesn't fit all. It really doesn't. So we gotta kind of get gotta get over that. Again, retrofits are expensive and limited, often ugly. Um, but here's one of the real kickers that's wonderful about universal design is that when you do this, when you consider all users, you're also considering multiple use cases and you come up with designs that just end up being good ideas. And so there are some classic examples of that, such as closed captioning, right? Originally happened through a lot of strong advocacy on the part of the deaf and hard of hearing community, but there are minor subset of the users of closed captioning now. There's tons of other reasons to use closed captioning. Curb cuts, um, bars to you, you push on to open up a door or levers, right? All, all of these instead of round doorknobs, right? These are just good ideas in general, but they came about by considering specific needs of specific populations, okay? So that's universal design. Um, I'm putting up a really wonderful infographic about the seven principles of universal design. Um, you wanna design for equitable use, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive use, information should be perceptible. You wanna to have tolerance for error, low physical effort, and size and space for approach and use, okay? These are the seven principles of universal design. And as you can tell, it's really mainly for a built environment, a physical environment. I also wanna point out that this infographic is, is itself highly inaccessible. <laughs> if you look at the link for the slides, you'll see that um, the, the link for this diagram goes to a more accessible version of these accessibility principles. Um, so that's universal design, right? So what is universal design for learning about and why does it exist? Universal design seems to cover the space of accessibility, accessibility pretty well, right? Universal design is about getting access in, 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 the, in the realm of learning. You could imagine it as being important for getting content or access to content, educational content and materials, and interfaces. That's necessary, but it's insufficient. In the learning world, we need to have students getting access to opportunities to learn, right? So, does, so what we mean, what we when we talk about accessibility, for example, with something that's gonna be a, a single transaction, like going to an ATM or a website for transferring money between accounts, access to content and interfaces is generally enough, but learning is a much more complicated an individual process. And universal design in and of itself does not go far enough to support designing of truly accessible and truly effective learning opportunities. So universal design for learning was formulated um, as a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how we learn, but based on those central tenets of universal design. So namely, that one size doesn't fit all, retrofits are expensive, so you wanna start thinking from the beginning and you wanna benefit all users in the end. Universal design for learning is not based on the seven principles 
of universal design because we've really felt that those are more, it's much, much more specific for the built environment, physical environment. So rather than coming up with this laundry list of considerations, and there are many best practices and research-based solutions out there for accessible, effective assessments and, 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 and instruction and materials, we came up with this framework based upon an understanding of the ways in which we have neurodiversity and how we learn. So very briefly, um, we want to have flexibility in the learning environments because of the differences in, in our affective networks, which control our engagement in the learning process. For we want to accommodate differences in our recognition networks um, by having multiple representations of information available for learners. And finally, in our differences in our strategic networks uh, by providing flexibility in action and expression. And the framework is designed to be applied to the development of standards and instructional goals of assessments, uh, learning and in, in instructional methods, as well as materials, okay, including curricula. The UDL guidelines themselves, this is a familiar um, placemat. I recommend everybody print it out on a color printer and laminate it. It'll be your friend. Um, don't have a lot of time to go through this now, but you can see that those are the three, those three columns are the ones I just talked about. And within each of these, there are three guidelines about how to provide options. So how do you provide options for, for representation? Think about options for perception, options for language and symbols, and options for comprehension. For engagement, you wanna provide options for recruiting, interest, sustaining effort and persistence, and for self-regulation and providing multiple means for action and expression by providing options for physical action, for expression and communication, and executive functions. As a general rule, a little bit of an oversimplification, when we talk about general accessibility principles, like those covered by the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and those that a lot of testing accommodations are concerned with, those tend to be the rows at the top, and those tend to be pretty much only in the representation and action expression columns, right? UDL really emphasizes that left column of engagement and these lower level processes by which we internalize learning. More information, udlguidelines.cast.org. Okay, I wanna say it again, everything in here, these are best practices of effective teaching and learning. A lot of these are research-based. UDL did not come up with these. UDL is an organizing framework for these. If, if we have to, as educational designers and scientists and innovators, deal with a laundry list of these kinds of things, we'll lose our minds. It's overwhelming. UDL can still be overwhelming. There's a lot here, there's a lot to unpack. But as an organizing structure, it makes it a lot easier to apply. UDL has been written into uh, uh, much federal education legislation and guidelines. I've listed some here. This does not include assessment. We'll talk about that in a moment. There's more and more evidence uh, accumulating for, I'm just getting this poll out of the way, uh, for the effectiveness of UDL. Some really big questions. If we had another two hours, we could start talking about this. But the, the big deal here is that there's still a lot of work to do, especially in assessment. And that's one of the reasons why we formed the special interest group. Okay. So more about UDL and assessment. You'll see earlier that when UDL was first conceptualized in the 90s, uh, assessment was part of the one of the four domains where, where UDL was to have impact. But there hasn't been a lot of progress. It's been kind of limited. When I first joined CAST in 2000, I put out a couple of papers, digging a little deeper in what do we mean when we talk about UDL and assessment. In 2005, I did some work with Tracy Hall and some other colleagues at CAST where we did a small scale research study saying if we apply UDL principles in designing uh, summative assessments, 
how might it improve how might, how might it impact students experience and improve or not improve um, measurement of construct relevant knowledge and skills um, starting in 2006 uh, in, in as a joint pro, uh, joint project with Pearson and cast we started developing these guidelines specifically for applying the universal design for learning principles to the development of computer-based tests um, and uh, specifically to support the development of innovative items. Um, and then there's some, some additional work and, and, and I wanna just go into those. I wanna talk a little bit about the work that Geneva Hartle and Bob Mislavy did. Uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, Edis Kelmaltz and Matt Silberglit and their teams took UDL principles and applied it to sim scientists, work that they did, uh, that they were doing at West Ed. There's been recently been a, a book chapter by David Rose, one of the co-founders of CAST and the originator of Universal Design for Learning, uh, re-examining Universal Design for Learning and assessment. And then finally, I'm gonna talk more about this in a moment, also um, some work by the Atlas team at KU on UDL and assessment. There are, at the bottom of the slide deck, I have all these references and I don't have links I apologize for those papers that are available digitally. I don't have links, but I'm hoping to get to that at some point in the next hours or days. All right. Um, so let's just talk about a few of these a little bit more. I mentioned the Universal Design for Computer-Based Testing Framework and Guidelines. These are freely available. Uh, it really takes a construct validity approach toward this whole question of applying Universal Design for Learning. Back when we started this effort, the current nine guidelines that you saw on that colorful chart there were only six um, so we were looking at perceptual linguistic cognitive motoric executive and affective aspects of diverse learners taking tests how can we support them and it was all predicated on the idea and this is just a little snippet on the screen right now of, uh, of the cheat sheets as part of the framework and guidelines that for example if you're designing an audio component as part of a stimulus in an, in an assessment task. Um, thinking about perceptual processing and, and the variety of perceptual processing abilities and challenges that students bring across the spectrum. What's construct relevant and what's not? If you're not intending to measure hearing ability, well, then consider design options such as providing visual alerts or captions. If you're not measuring auditory threshold, well then adjustable volume. And I talk all the time at the example of, of a Snell and acuity test, right? If you're trying to find out somebody's visual acuity, you don't give them a large print version of this, right? Because that's the intended construct is their visual acuity. But in educational assessment, that's obviously rarely the case. So then why not allow somebody to use their reading glasses or get large print or be able to change the font size, right? So that's what this, the whole process of applying these guidelines is all about is, is scaffolding assessment designers developers through figuring out what's construct relevant and what's not, considering the diversity, the neurodiversity of the tested population, and then design considerations to support that. Bob, let me stop you for just a moment. We have an interesting comment in the chat from Richard. Yes. And he mentioned that NCEO has several brief and guide, brief guidance docs on universal design. And yes. I thought this might be a good opportunity for you to discuss the differences between the NCEO guidance documents and what CAST is offering with this framework. My, my friend and colleague, Richard, you are the perfect plant. You just came in about three minutes too early. So hold uh. that thought. <laughs> I'm gonna be doing exactly that. I'm gonna be comparing and contrasting other efforts to bring universal design into assessment. I promise. But I just wanna quickly mention a couple other UDL applications. Um, Bob Mislavy and Geneva Hartle and I wrote an IES proposal in the mid-2000s to specifically take UDL and the UDL guidelines, assessment guidelines, and weave them into the PADI system, which is an implementation of evidence-centered design, All right? Again, look at, big look at the process of bringing these complicated guidelines into uh, assessment development. Um, and then most recently, Lindsay Ruder and Megan Carvinen have similarly, de similarly developed a tool for applying UDL principles to assessment. And 
Just so happens they're gonna be presenting on this on Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern at the seventh annual UDL symposium uh, being held virtually. So by all means, go see this presentation. Um, again, the links to this are in the, uh, in the slides. So this is an active link. You can get more information here. But I've seen this tool. This tool was developed as part of a, an enhanced assessment grant that we're working on together. And it's really cool stuff, all right? Universal design and assessment. It's a completely different thing. And it's confusing. Most people in the assessment world are more familiar with the efforts to align universal design to assessment development than universal design for learning, okay? It started with the work of Sandy Thompson, Christopher Johnson, and Martha Thurlow at NCEO. Thanks again, Richard. Um, they defined seven principles for making sure tests are accessible and fair. You have to attend to inclusive populations. You have to define your constructs precisely. You need to have accessible and non-biased items. You must develop these items to be amenable to accommodations. Instructions and procedures should be simple, clear, and intuitive. You must maximize readability and comprehensibility as well as legibility, okay? Really very grounded, very down-to-earth suggestions. Largely, so it was first, this is 2002, so this is about 20 years ago, largely geared toward how testing was done at the time with a little bit of a look into the future, a little bit of look into technology that was coming down the pike. When most people talk about universal design and assessment, this is what they're talking about. There's been other work too. Leanne Ketterlin Geller has been doing some really great thinking about how do you apply universal design principles and ideas to assessment. And I have a screenshot here from a JTLA paper she published back in 2005. Leanne defines universal design for assessment as an integrated system with a broad spectrum of possible supports so as to provide the best environment in which to capture student knowledge and skills. Again, you can see how this aligns with the central tenets of universal design as originally proposed by Ron Mace. Um, I was part of a team in 2000, leading, uh, just before 2010, um, there was this uh, symposium on technology enabled and universally designed assessments. It came out with this, this, this uh, summary statement, which is really calling for and hoping to stimulate more research. This also, the definition of universal design was a more general definition. It was not specific to universal design for learning. Universal design for learning was called out in this paper, but really most of this is more a general description of universal design. All right. Um, that's my last slide. Hey, it's 20 minutes exactly. Okay, I, before I turn things over to Erin, I just wanna repeat, this was a really fast nickel tour of of the realm of universal design, universal design for learning, and how each of those has been applied to assessment. Um, as we move forward through the panel discussion, one of the things we'll have to keep asking ourselves is, okay, are we talking about universal design or are we talking about universal design for learning here? Again, universal design for learning, although it's been around a long time, it's more of a newcomer in terms of gaining traction in the assessment space. So back to our original question, um, if I can get there, can universal design for learning promote assessment fairness and equity? That's one of the things we want to explore. And we want to explore it with a really open mind. Yes, UDL was designed to support assessment in addition to instruction. It's made tremendous inroads in terms of instruction and even materials and other applications of assessment I'm sorry, other aspects of learning, but in the assessment world, I, I think, although obviously I'm a little biased here, I think it does have application. I think it needs to remain an open question. And specifically when we're talking about equity and fairness, can UDL be useful? Can it be used? And I'd like to turn things now over to Erin, who's going to facilitate the panel discussion. Sure. Thanks, Bob. And now we get to hear from folks who are in the field and people who are doing the work. 
And of course, we would still welcome any sort of comments or questions in the chat. We love to receive those and we promise we'll do our best to get to them. So to our panelists, I wanted to start with this question here. And it's kind of more of a statement of where we are rather than what universal design for learning could be. And that is, what are some of the ways that current assessment standards and practices may create instruments that are less inclusive, less equitable, or less fair for certain types of groups of students, which we know may result in an invalid interpretation of the assessment and poor use of the assessment results. So let's discuss current assessment standards and how they may be a barrier to fairness. And I'm gonna hand that off first to Kristen. Do you wanna start addressing that question? Uh, sure, I'll do my best. I'm really eager to hear um, from, from Jennifer and Michael um, on this question as well. So I won't take too long. Um, I'll start out by saying I, I've been um, working in assessment design um, for um, uh, almost 30 years. And I have um, truly, I think, um, uh, absorbed and um, uh, placed in, a, in a, a position of honor the UDL or UD guidelines for assessment. Um, these were um, front and center uh, when I was uh, working on assessments at ETS and then from there uh, at the College Board and from there uh, with PARC and SBAC and the Common Core assessments. Uh, and they were front and center and still are because these are the coin of the realm in a large scale assessment, especially for K-12, especially for computer-based assessments. So they are still uh, what we abide by here at Curriculum Associates. However, in the past uh, couple of years, my thinking has evolved and evolved rapidly. Um, because I think that uh, first, we as assessment designers, especially those of us who, um, you know, Bob, I was digesting those patty technical papers as they were coming out in the early and mid 2000s. And, um, you know, for those of us who have uh, prided ourselves as assessment designers, right, we really have to start with the question that's being asked. And I want to start the question by saying, what does it mean to have inclusive, equitable, and fair assessments? Because before I can answer your questions, I, we have to come to agreement on what that means. And so what's, what's been happening for me personally in this field, with the help of my advisors, Jennifer Randall, Michael Rodriguez, others on our uh, panel for culturally and linguistically responsive, sustaining, and um, anti-racist assessment is we're interrogating and redefining what it means to have inclusive, equitable, and fair. Because um, in a nutshell, and this can be um, part of our discussion, when I read through the universal design uh, research, uh, there has been a uh, explicit effort to think about uh, all students, inclusive students, but in my mind, in reading it now, as opposed to if I read it five years ago, that's looking at students across the spectrum from a, you know, students with different physical and uh, cognitive um, uh, diversity. But what about looking at what it means to be inclusive, fair, and equitable when you're thinking about students from marginalized and oppressed communities? And what does it mean to have a fully uh, inclusive and fair and equitable assessment from that perspective? And I have not seen evidence, and I'm happy to be corrected, but I have not seen evidence that the guidelines take that perspective into account. That, I'll start with that, Erin. All right, that sounds great. That's a way to kick us off. Thank you very much. And so, Michael, I'll throw it over to you for a second, and I'll build on what Kristen was talking about. 
if we're going to define what inclusive means for these assessments, who do you see as the intended population? What is an inclusive assessment? All right. Uh, maybe I could, let me give a little bit of context on some work that I'm doing, uh, just to give some context to the response to that question in terms of the who. Uh, you're asking the who question. Uh, recently, I have been spending a lot of time working with schools and helping them think about balanced assessment systems. Um, so naturally, since I'm in schools, I'm focusing on assessments that inform teaching and learning. The other part of my time, I'm spending creating early childhood language development measures and tools. Uh, and this is for children speaking English, Spanish, Hmong, Ojibwe. We are developing assessment activities that are grounded in language development in that language community rather than translating English early childhood assessments. This summer, we're working with tribal elders to explore Ojibwe language relevant to child development. And we're pursuing the development of an indigenous language children's literature uh, team, uh, because there's very little of it, as you might imagine. The challenges that I face in, in these contexts are really bar buried in layers of barriers. Few educators have deep understanding of state standards. Few state standards encompass cultural and linguistic disciplinary knowledge and practice. Few educators also have deep understanding of the role and function of the many levels of assessment and assessment data that they're asked to put to use. Schools are buried in data these days, uh, and so much so that they become immobilized. This also includes, as we heard a little bit earlier, limited understanding of formative and summative uses of assessment data. And in part, that's fueled by an exploding marketplace of so-called formative assessments with, with little guidance and support. Now, there are some organizations that provide deep guidance and support, uh, but the vast majority of it comes without the, those supports. So in terms of the who, uh, those of us in educational measurement can easily say teachers are the ultimate purveyors of measurement. They're doing measurement all day long. They do measurement from when they greet kids at the door. They watch, they listen, they pose questions. They have students do small group work, big group work, projects, long-term projects. Um, they're, they're giving quizzes and assignments and, and tests and, and homework and uh, they're, they're most of the time they're listening and observing. There are places uh, where schools are engaged in standards-based grading, focusing on what students know and can do rather than the number of points earned on a worksheet or point deductions due to late homework or tardiness. There are places where schools employ project-based learning or have students develop portfolios where students uncover progress along a learning projection. Uh, but, but there are fewer, far fewer schools that encompass what students bring into the classroom in terms of their disciplinary knowledge and practice from, from tradition, from culture, from language, uh, into the standards-based disciplinary knowledge and practice. And this is what uh, the team that Kristen has pulled together with Jennifer uh, has been diving into. Uh, you've got some questions that are coming up in a little bit that really connect these things to UDL. Uh, and I, I think it's the idea of multiple means, multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation that we can really take advantage of in assessment design because it's, it's the multiple means that acknowledges cultural and linguistic disciplinary knowledge and practice, the many ways of knowing and doing. The unfortunate part is, you know, our, our standards are still baked in a system that try to uh, create universal, so-called so universal access by not privileging any particular community. And Jennifer has 
communicated with us all that that's really not possible because language is probably the most culturally embedded component we have. And as soon as we start talking or writing or creating tasks or test items, they're, they're grounded in some perspective. They're grounded in some experience. They're grounded in some knowledge. The question is, is who's? So your question about who is really critical. Uh, and my focus lately has been with teachers. And, and, and unfortunately, teachers don't necessarily play a role in the development of large scale assessments. Uh, but I think it's UDL that potentially has the greatest power to, to move large scale assessment development. And, and hopefully we can come back to this idea in a little bit, because I do want to dig into this idea of multiple means. And what does that mean for the test developer? With classroom teachers, we can continue to work to help teachers get to know their students, get to know their students' communities, their families, and what they bring into the classroom. So Michael, it sounds like one of the things you said in there, and I'll throw it over to Jennifer, one of the things you said is that the current content standards are not necessarily understood by the teachers or accessible to the who that we are trying to assess. And if our system is set up that the assessment is aligned with those content standards, we might have a problem. So I'm gonna throw that to Jennifer for a second and, and can you talk more about how the current standards might create these instruments that are less inclusive based on language, disability or any other right. characteristic? I'm going to first interrupt for yeah. just a moment because I see AJ. Do you have a question? Sorry, Jennifer. I just wanted to recognize AJ. Thank you, sir. I don't agree with Michael for a few things based on my own experience. I came from Oregon, and I worked the, work in the Debel team, and we also I also designed and worked the Asian Asian Stages Questionnaire, which we do the assessment. I'm, I'm coming from assessment background and very deep research background. So I don't agree a few things. Like when I was working ESQ team, I myself worked with the team, with the US team. I designed a new agent tool, which were in the market this year sometimes, which is succeed ESQ. And earlier I worked with the India, with the, with the Hindi, Hindi language. I worked in Macedonia with the Macedonian. I worked in Korea in the Korean language. We never translated. What we did, we see the item, what we have in English, and we try to find similar item in the, their language, but we didn't translate anything in, in our team, what my experience coming from 2009. And coming from assessment, and then UDL is different. I'm talking about the assessment background and the research. So, we never, and then when I was working in the Devils team, I worked with the, with the Spanish thing in, in English, we never translated in Spanish or English. So what we did, we tried to find the similar item, which makes a similar sense without translating the whole thing. And since I also know the 11 language, I never tried to translate anything in any language. And English is my third language. I never had any issue. Because for, since my dad, he taught me from the beginning, never try to translate, try to think in their own language. Otherwise you lose the whole concept. So I never translated anything in my whole life personally. And never, I never saw that thing happen in my research team. So that's why I don't, partially I don't agree, I might be wrong, but it's my personal experience. And when I was working the AERA also with the Division D, same thing I saw over there. Nobody translated. They come with the, their own ideas and they try to match the concept, what we are doing in the particular language. So make sure that we are not losing the meaning of that thing, what we are trying to do with that particular child or with the particular subject. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I think that's a good point. And you know, you are talking about a universal design for learning principle, which is not retrofitting an assessment with this translation, but rather starting from the beginning with the concept, right? And so I think that fits in really well with what we're talking about here. Jennifer, did you want to have um, to say? I, I, I didn't may add one more thing. Sure. And when I wrote my two books, both, both are in the Library of Congress also in the uh, Harvard and all the uh, libraries. I also didn't try to do that. We tried to think in their particular, like when uh, I was planning to do the Japanese professor, same thing. He was uh, considered the father of one thing in the, in the world. And then he also didn't try to translate anything with Japanese. He tried to think and then we talked together and then he designed what we are doing in the US, same thing with their own language in Japanese. Since, mm -hmm. but I don't know line, uh, Japanese, so 
I just was sitting and watching how his team was doing, exactly, even he came up with a better idea what we were doing in the US. But again, he said this, he used the same thing. He start thinking in their own language, getting the concept of what we are doing in the US, and then he came up with a better idea for the Japanese uh, population. So he didn't translate anything in the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, let me let me just say we're we're in agreement. So I'm I'm not sure where you think we're in disagreement because we're not. So appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So I might not be because my cat was moving around, so I got distracted also. So that's why I said I'm not sure. Maybe I'm missing something. So I might have different experience or different ideas. So I'm not saying I didn't disagree or agree. I said I might be because she was moving around and she's kind of a small, small baby. She needs attention every 10 minutes. So that's what it is. Okay, let's actually move on to the next question. I, we are doing really well on time, but I do wanna have uh, some time at the end for some summing up question and answer session. Did we wanna uh, have Jennifer's input first? On well, I was sure I was going to get her input on the next one, but you may, Jennifer, if you had an input on that first question. I'm sorry, and I may have almost forgotten the first question. I, I did have a thought, um, but it has escaped me. Um, we, we can move on to the next question. I'm sorry. Okay, if it comes no, back, me, we will circle Aaron, back. If I may, let me let me um, encourage Jennifer because Jennifer, you have so much to say on this particular issue, and it's it's about the content of our academic standards. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for reminding me um, of, of where we were there. So I so I'm in I'm in agreement with Michael and and also with Kristen in in two ways. One in thinking about we we do have to define what we mean by fairness and and inclusion. Um, and for me, what that means is um, centering the most marginalized groups, right? That those people become the center um, of our discussions, that they be the center of our, the forefront of our minds when we are designing these assessments, and most importantly, when we are defining the constructs. And I find in educational assessment, in particular, the standards that we operate by are pretty much what the construct is, right? So people try to get at that construct, whatever it is, through those standards, and then our assessments are, are developed based on, on those standards, as, as Michael discussed. And for me, we have to be explicit with respect to justice and anti-racism and being culturally sustaining, both in those standards, um, and then also in, in the assessment. Um, so for me, it's about the, the articulation of the construct is the most important part. Um, I've heard Michael talk about, you know, maybe we, because constructs are so squishy and gishy that maybe that's not the place to start. Maybe it's really to really think about the, the content domain. And I actually, I don't disagree with him at all. I think if I could trust people um, to take the constructs as they are currently written, and develop assessments that are in fact equitable and that center marginalized groups and that are anti-racist because you can. You can absolutely take every standard and develop an assessment that does that. And I've been in rooms with people where they've shown me a standard, shown me an item and say, tell me how to make this anti-racist. And I can do that. But that's not what most people do, right? We can't trust people to do that. What we have to do is redefine that construct so that you have no choice as an assessment person, but to write items that are culturally sustaining and anti-racist. Um, so, so that's where I stand in terms of where we can do better, kind of that, that initial question, how do we at this time how we've come up with these assessments that aren't necessarily inclusive, that aren't necessarily equitable. I think the problem is, is that the construct isn't. So where we're starting is inequitable. And so by definition, the standards will be, and then by definition, the assessments may be. So I'm, I'm an advocate of going back to the beginning. And for me, fairness is centering the most marginalized groups. Not everyone agrees with that, but if I was going to pick a definition, that's where I would go. 
So you're saying don't just take it back to the standards level, take it all the way back to the construct level. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Right, and what would assessment developers need? What kind of support would they need to do that? What kind of encouragement would they need to do that? How do we get that done? Jennifer, thoughts of how that's can to we... me or that to oh, everyone? Oh, I was just curious of what your thoughts were. Getting back to the construct level, how can we? Yeah. How can we get there? Um. So this is where I think the the instruction side of the world, where teachers are ahead of us, um, with in terms of ahead of us, us being assessment people, I should say, is that they are already figuring out ways to do culturally relevant pedagogy in, in their classroom spaces. I know there are schools committed to culturally relevant teaching in those spaces and districts following, following behind. Um, and I'm going to ignore for a moment the places that have lost their freaking minds and keep screaming about critical race theory and how the world is burning. We're gonna just ignore those for a second and recognize that that too will pass and focus on the people who are doing the work right now. So I think we need to take a look at their playbook, um, which I think is just this commitment to, to liberatory education and what it's going to require in assessment are for people like me and for people who, who are on, on this call to, to be unapologetic in their commitment to this work and to be willing to be attacked for that work. Um, because there's just no other way around it. So if you're only willing to do it in so much as it is convenient, if you're only willing to do it in so much as people will step aside and allow you to, then you shouldn't even bother trying to do it. We have to force people to write this work, to do this work, to write equity, to write justice into the construct, to write it into the standards, um, and that may mean um, leveraging what teachers are already doing, bringing in stakeholders from the community, engaging parents, engaging students, um, listening to their voices when they say this is what we want in our spaces, as opposed to what we typically do, is, which is say, yes, that is what you want, but then provide a list of reasons why they can't have it. Um, usually around the rules of assessment, right? This is how we design our assessments. We can't do it like this because it might hurt Susan over here or piss off Susan's mom. We usually don't say that, but we imply that. Um, so I think it's, yeah, we, a revolution. This is what we need, Aaron. Okay. Yeah, if I, if I might, those of us that are in the educational measurement arena that are test developers, item developers, we, are, we often feel constrained by the test specs. The test specifications come to us. The, the construct is already defined. Oftentimes the standards are laid out with benchmarks that are, that are required to be assessed. And, and then we're stuck. But not only are we stuck by the test specs, we're stuck by the item writing guidelines uh, that are delivered to us, the item specifications. And if I may, let me just give you a, a couple of examples from our own standards. The, these are test, the standards for educational and psychological testing are, are kind of our guidebook. Uh, there's no enforcement agency, but we kind of enforce each other through social moderation to follow the standards. It's, a, it's a, a, an agreement among those of us that are in this arena on, on how we should conduct our work. Uh, and in the standards, the authors offer general examples of how tests may limit access to the construct for some. They suggest by including idiomatic phrases, regional vocabulary unrelated to the target construct or stimulus contexts unfamiliar to test takers given their cultural background. They also say that uh, these test characteristics that I just mentioned, they're not explained. There are no specific examples offered in the testing standards. Uh, most test developers do consider person characteristics often because of NCEO's work so for example, blindness, dyslexia, limited English proficiency, how do these things interact with, with test taking and accessibility? But the characteristics that are, that I think 
are opened up through universal design for learning uh, can really improve accessibility because they're not limited to these surface features, uh, the surface feature of looking at an exam or looking at a test or looking at a test question. But I think they open the door for us to consider sociocultural context of test takers. Uh, th there is, uh, th there are threats to fairness and there are threats to fairness that are baked into test content. A and Jennifer has been talking a little bit about this. She's written a little bit about this. And it's really a function of cultural and linguistic histories. Uh, as an example, the authors of the testing standards argue that a critical reading as a component of an assessment should not include words and expressions, especially associated with particular occupations, disciplines, cultural background, socioeconomic status, racial ethnic group, or geographic location, so as to maximize the measurement of the construct. Wow, how boring of a test it has to, you know, it, that, that we create because it's void of life and void of humanity. Uh, we're supposed to be minimizing con confounding factors with measurement, particularly prior knowledge and experience. How is prior knowledge and experience a confounding factor in terms of many ways of knowing and doing, of coming together with disciplinary knowledge and practices? Um, so, so I think even in the, the standards that we try to live by, we are constrained. Uh, and, and where do construct definitions come from? Construct definitions largely come from professional organizations that have come together and decided this is how we define our field. This is how we define the state of knowledge. And where, do, where does that come from? Universities. Universities are the knowledge generators. In some cases, practitioners, because we learn a lot through practice, but we learn a lot uh, through research. And, and somehow these come to form professional organizations that define their field and define what people should know and be able to do. And those then are picked up by, by states, by collaboratives, by PARC, Smarter Balanced. <laughs> you know, they've tapped into these, these sort of professional organization definitions of, of constructs and what we expect people to know and be able to do. Yet, there are traditional disciplinary knowledge and practices that have made communities successful for generations outside these professional organizations and outside universities. And, and somehow we've ignored that. And, and because of that, we are losing so many students. We're losing so many bright stars, innovators. Right. Michael, I think that's such a good point. And we're going to get to this idea of you know involving stakeholders and who are the stakeholders currently and who should they be. And I'm hoping that we can return to this. Right now, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We've talked about uh, some of the problems that these instruments have in terms of being inclusive. And this next question is kind of a two-part question. So what do the principles of universal design for learning offer to solve or exacerbate some of the design challenges that we just identified? So it, again, it's a two part. So it, it talk about how UDL for assessment could possibly solve some of these things that we're talking about. And in some ways, make a few things, make a few of the challenges possibly even more challenging. Kristen, let's start with you again. Thank you. Um, I, I think that, you know, when I look at um, the universal design guidelines, the um, uh, the VCAG guidelines and, and other guidelines out there. Um, and I am grateful for uh, what these guidelines have done for students with um, who, who are diverse in terms of their uh, physical abilities and diverse in terms of their cognitive abilities. However, I think that they need to uh, be revised um, to think about things from truly all students. And here I am speaking of students from uh, cultures and backgrounds that, who have been traditionally and currently uh, marginalized. And so, for example, one of the themes that runs throughout universal design, and I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on this, I'm basing the following on my 
uh, my own reading of the literature and my own um, uh, involvement in many, many, many uh, design sessions with um, people who are tasked with interpreting these guidelines when they're sitting down to write items. And one of the themes that runs throughout these UD guidelines is the notion that, uh, and this gets back to defining the construct, of what construct irrelevant variance is and what extraneous content is. I can't tell you how many times uh, you know, I've sat around and we've edited anything um, uh, out of an item that is remotely um, interesting or anything that could be engaging to a student in the, in the name of making the item more neutral, more objective, um, and in the name of making the item accessible. It literally, the, the, the notion that extraneous content um, is construct irrelevant or gets in the way of measurement instead of facilitates measurement, I think needs to be redebated. Um, uh, we know that we have a problem engaging students with um, uh, assessment. Um, uh, just ask any student or teacher, right? And, uh, and um, I also think that when we uh, try to honor the funds of knowledge that students bring to the classroom, when we try to, uh, and there are some beautiful curricula and instructional practice out, practices out there that are truly creating you know, um, culturally uh, responses and sustaining classrooms. And if assessment is to mirror what happens in the classroom, we need to do that in assessment. And if we create assessments uh, that engage students from a variety of backgrounds, if we create assessments that are engaging um, to, to students and reflect their own cultural um, experiences, we will violate the current UD guidelines, period, end of sentence. And so um, we can debate about what this means for just defining the construct. I think um, we're just starting to get into those conversations. I think it's, I'm, I'm eager to, to jump in there. Um, but even if we leave the constructs exactly the same, and just change our notions of what's construct irrelevant, I think we could make progress. Uh, so I don't, um, so Jennifer and Michael, I agree, we need to change the construct. I can make assessments better right now if I can just redefine what's irrelevant, <laughs> if that makes any sense. It does, and I'll throw it over to uh, the other panelists, but it sounds like what you're bringing up is this tension, you know, between flexibility and standardization, between uh, you know, taking out all of the construct irrelevant pieces and then by virtue of doing so, making it less engaging to the student. So- um, It's not just less engaging. Let me, let me, let me uh, correct that. I, I think it can be different than less engaging. I think it can be harmful. Hmm. When we design items that lack context. Um, and many times what we are doing is um, putting forth a view of the world uh, from a, a dominant culture that has caused harm to black and brown students. And we need to rethink what it would be like to be a student, uh, a, a baby sitting in, you know, third or fourth grade, engaging with an assessment where it, it is um, literally erasing who they are. That's not just lack of engagement, that is doing harm. And it's probably not an accurate measure of what they know and can do and bring to the table. Yeah, let me, let me just amplify a piece of what Kristen is saying there. Um, when, I, when I talk with educators, we talk a lot about, we, we begin with learning objectives. What do we really hope to achieve with our students? What are the claims we want to make 
about our students when they leave our class. And we're not so good about communicating those with students. I, I think this is part of universal design for learning that the clarity in our communication with, with, uh, with our learners, oftentimes students get the clearest message of what's important in a subject matter by what shows up on the test. Because it must be important if it's not on the test. And if students regularly take tests that ignore them, that don't reflect their experience, their language, their background, that don't reflect them, they're getting the message that they're not important in this particular subject matter or this field, that they're not relevant. And, and it is this cultural and linguistic extraction that you've got to give up all this stuff because if you want to be a scientist, none of that stuff is going to help you be a scientist. If you want to be a mathematician, this is the road to math. And all of that, that all of those things that you understood about math that you brought into the classroom, it's not important because it never shows up on the test. And, and this is why test design is so critical. It's so important because it's not just a measure of what students know and can do. It's a communication tool of what's important in the field and what it takes to succeed in the field. So this idea of multiple representation, I just wanna like blow that up and make that huge. Multiple representation, this is what accomplished teachers really get. They get that, they get differentiated instruction, they get acknowledging wh where students are at on learning progressions. They find every possible way to represent disciplinary knowledge and practice and acknowledge what students know and can do. That multiple representation thing, I think, is, is perhaps the key to, to really embedding the ideas of universal design for learning in assessment. And Jennifer, I saw you nodding in agreement the whole time. Do you want to expand on any of those points that Michael just made? Yeah, absolutely. As I was looking, and I should also put the caveat there out that I'm not a universal design for learning expert. Um, and I've actually learned a lot just talking with these folks over the last few weeks. Um, but yes, to me, this notion of, of, of multiple representations is really where we can get at, um, where we can really, well, assessment can actually become assessment for learning in addition to of learning, right? So if we can, so perhaps student A is not familiar with this, with this kind of cultural representations or expectations before sitting down to an assessment. But there's so many things we can do now, um, technology that we can leverage to, to teach what that is as part of the assessment. And then also um, assess what students already know in that process. Um, and also as I was, I was looking through the universal design for learning guidelines, um, trying to think about ways in which these guidelines could promote equitable assessment and, and also where it kind of, I won't say that it, it doesn't, I'm saying maybe some missed opportunities, for example. Um, guideline six, I love talking about executive functioning. Um, and in that guideline in particular, it, it says of critical importance to educators is the fact that executive functions have very limited capacity due to working memory. This is true because executive capacity is sharply reduced when executive functioning capacity must be devoted to managing lower level skills and responses which are not automatic or fluent, thus the capacity for higher level function is taken. And to me, if we we're thinking about equitable assessment, especially with respect, I'm gonna talk about race. That becomes exponentially more difficult when the student has to, in class or on an assessment, figure out how to be white. So if all of your capacity, that lower your, your strength, that lower level capacity is devoted to thinking about what does whiteness look like? How would whiteness answer this question? How is whiteness being perceived? How do I ignore, as Michael was saying, everything that is about me, that matters about me and my people um, and my language and my culture and my community and focus on this thing? How much of that functioning is devoted to that and not even to engaging with the question, to being able to answer the question or doing the task. 
Um, so I feel like that's a place where, you know, UDL is right on, on point, right? This is a problem. This is something we need to think about. I think we're usually thinking about it with reference to something else and not about how assessment and instruction can be erasing one's culture and what that does to executive functioning when students are sitting in spaces um, in either case. And also guideline nine focuses on self-regulation, which I have come to hate that word with all of the things I have in me because of how it has been applied um, in spaces, right? You're basically self-regulation and self-regulation as represented by whiteness. So how do I figure out how to get these black kids to get control of their bodies in this space? Because for whatever reason, I'm terrified of a bunch of six-year-old black kids in my classroom. Um, and so when we spend our time as, as teachers um, trying to get students to self-regulate in the way that represents how we self, how, I shouldn't say we because I am not white, but the way whiteness self-regulates, um, this becomes a, becomes a problem for students in terms of learning and also in terms of, of assessment. So I think, um, I agree with Kristen, as I read the UDL guidelines, they read as if they, they had students with disabilities in mind. And I would really like us to, you know, whoever does this to consider extending them in such a way that, that at least race, right? Because we're always so scared of talking about race. But I think it has to be explicit in the guidelines. Otherwise, just like I talked about content standards mapping back to constructs, and it could be anti-racist, it won't be anti-racist unless it's explicit in the construct. And I feel the same with the UDL guidelines. People won't apply them in an anti-racist way unless it is explicit within the UDL guidelines that it needs to be anti-racist. Jennifer, this is so right on to, I, I, I've got a lot of quotes here I'm writing down from what you're saying. There's an effort underway now um, led by CAST to Develop, uh, develop UDL 3.0, we're, call, causing, we're calling this effort rising to equity. UDL has implicitly, but not explicitly addressed many of these concerns. And you are correct. The origins of this come from serving students with disabilities. And more and more, we're starting to realize where it falls short. Implicit is not enough. Um, and, um, we're starting to wrestle with some really tough questions. And I think your comments on self-regulation are like, are eye-opening for me. Uh, yeah, whose definition of self-regulation and to what purpose is this another, is, could this be leveraged as written now as a way of exercising control over students in ways in which they have no agency and their, their culture has no agency over what defines appropriate self-regulation. So. Thank you. And I'm going to paste the link in, uh, it gives a little bit of a um, little insight into this new effort of, of UDL rising to equity um, uh, for folks who are interested. And uh, I also wanted to go to the comment section. Karina posted, what a valuable comment, Jennifer. And she did this right after you were talking about executive functioning and how all of those lower level skills were t being used up. And one of the examples you gave was kids are putting in so much energy trying to be white before they can start answering this question. And that was, that struck me because it is not something I have ever thought about while taking a test. Yeah. And I just, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing that. And I think Karina also was really struck by that comment. Yeah. So, oh yes, Bob. Yeah, I just wanna say, I mean, we're ignoring decades and decades of research that talk about how this type of a distraction impacts our performance. We know this, why do we keep doing this? I mean, there's research now looking at distracted driving and you know whether handheld phones or even when they're not in your hands distract us from driving. And we know the answer to that one. So hopefully we're learning, hopefully we're coming up with, but we're completely ignoring it in education. So I, I, I wanna acknowledge something I've heard from some of our new teachers. Um, we, 
we prepare our teachers, I think, to be professionals. And we think about teaching as a profession. And we, we encourage our teachers to be immersed not only in their subject matter, but in their students' communities and, and to be able to connect those two and to be innovators. Uh, and, and new teachers are always very excited and they're, they're looking forward to breaking new ground and, and they show up at a school building on day one, perhaps not technically day one, but when they, when they show up in their school building, they're greeted with a stack and often they're told something like, here's what we teach, here's how we teach it, and here's where you need to be on May 1st. And it, it doesn't provide the opportunity to, to engage in that sort of innovation and immersion in the subject matter and in your, your students, families, and communities. Uh, and many of the traditional ways of teaching, here's how we teach, and here's what we teach, don't encompass multiple means of engagement and multiple means of representation, the, the core principles of, of UDL. I, I think we can, we can put this in teacher preparation and we can prepare our teachers to do so, but then they are mentored and supervised and reviewed by folks that perhaps don't employ those principles. And, and it's extracted once again. Uh, we did have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, I was just going to reflect. This is, you know, my thinking earlier when I, when I first introduced my, my first response with this idea that I often feel like the barriers are multi-level. There are layers <laughs> of things. And it's, it's, I, I wish I could point to the one thing that we could really work on. And it really requires multiple layers, multiple audiences, multiple stakeholders. Uh, the idea of the construct, who defines the construct? There's this, there's this cycle that is quite closed, right? Because even if we look at, we, we look at professional associations, the, the folks that define the state of the art of science, of math, of reading, of literature, of, I mean, who's, who's leading those organizations? Who are the faculty in the departments that are generating the knowledge? And, and what are their values and principles? And the, there's so many pieces. It's not, it's not one, there's not one place for us to work, to, to do this work. It, it's, I, I get overwhelmed a little bit. Right. It's, it's like peeling the onion, right? So you, you, you have peeled away one layer and yet there's so much more to go. Um, but I do want to jump into question three here because it gets to this idea of who's defining the construct, who are we involving, who are the stakeholders, including students, right? So question three is, how can the measurement, instruction, and UDL communities work together to create instruments that meet the needs of a broad range of education stakeholders, including students? So we've talked about the, the narrow group of people who are putting input into the system. Who else should we involve? Who are the stakeholders? And how can we authentically reach out to them? And I'll throw that out there to any of our panelists. So I'm going to throw out one piece of the, the peel one piece of the onion, because I agree with you so much, Michael. It's, it's so multi-layered. And I was having conversations with colleagues before about the barriers to implementing culturally relevant teacher teaching and teachers laying out these multi-layers of barriers that exist for them. But I think one barrier towards getting the information we need is that we don't listen to communities, that we don't listen to parents. Um, you know, there's a lot of information, research out there around uh, cultural funds of knowledge and the benefits of, of being in communities and, you know, in my own research, interviewing parents about the things that matter to them and, and what they value. Um, and to me, the key to that, though, is figuring out a way for parents to be heard and, and for them to know how to make sure they are heard. And so there's, for example, there's one organization that I became aware of and much of what they do, Village of Wisdom, is train parents to, to operate in school districts, to operate in communities in ways that get them heard. Like that's, that's the work that they do. Um, 
so that parents can walk into school board meetings, so that they can walk into to buildings, into school buildings, um, and get what they need for their students in those communities and actually be heard. And to me, that's one little piece um, that's happening that needs to be extended. Like we need to spend more time um, showing parents how they can actually be heard because we say we want to hear them, but then we only pick the parents of the kids that we grew up with, right? Or we only pick the parents that, that are in our particular church group or, or what have you. We don't actually get out into these spaces and talk to parents or we send out flyers and you know, a very specific type of parents is always the parent that's gonna respond and say, I wanna provide you with my feedback. So I think really building these organizations within these communities and then listening to what they have to say is just this one little piece. I'll uh, add on yes. to that. I, I strongly uh, agree with Jennifer that we need to um, do better as a measurement community, um, listening to, to stakeholders and, and starting with parents and students, right? So one of the things that um, I, um, you know, in traditional test development um, fashion, uh, the first time that you get input from students on items is when the items are field tested. Uh, we need to change that completely. Students need to be at the table uh, when we're designing items. And um, uh, I, I feel grateful that we're starting to do some of that uh, where I work. Um, but um, I would add that before the, and this is to your question, Aaron, like how the UD instruction measurement communities can come together. Um, I'm, well, this, this webinar is one example, right? This, this discussion. Uh, so again, thank you. Thank you, Bob and, and Aaron and Molly for this invitation. Um, I would say though, that even within, like for example, within the measurement community, we're still having to convince people that what we're talking about is a problem to be solved, right? And, and so um, we've got to have our own reckoning within the measurement community before we can hold hands as a community with, and join forces with other communities to make change. Uh, so, um, and I think that reckoning happens with conversations like this. Uh, the reckoning happens with um, redesigning of documents like this, uh, and the reckoning happens with conversations and um, being willing to unlearn uh, what we have been doing and practicing for decades and rethink. It's a it's a journey of vulnerability and braveness. And it, it really starts with, with individuals and with conversations and with dialogue. Yeah, let me add just a, a couple of things and they, they actually nicely augment what's already been said. Um, I, I do some writing on item development, item writing, uh, and in part because of where I went to grad school. Uh, I was an Ebel scholar, uh, Bob Ebel, is known for writing the first comprehensive chapter on item writing in the 1951 edition of Educational Measurement. And I, I know there's some measurement folks on the call, uh, some folks that have been in testing companies and folks that have sat on technical advisory committees. And, and we all play a role in this. Uh, I write that item development is a collaborative process. And I should be writing that item development should be a collaborative process <laughs> because uh, even I think in the best intentioned shops uh, of test development, uh, item writing is still kind of segmented. It, it goes to this team, and then it goes to that team, and then it goes to the sensitivity review committee, and then it goes to the editors, and then it goes for pilot, and then it goes to the analysts, and then it goes to the technical committee, and then it goes, you know, instead of us coming together <laughs> and, and learning from each other and having a conversation about what are these items doing? And, and are these items doing what we intend them to do? Uncover student thinking and, and for us to know how students are learning, how they're progressing. Uh, 
So I think we have, we have a lot to do that we could be doing in item and test development for sure. We could add classroom experience, if not instruction around UDL to graduate programs preparing measurement specialists and psychometricians. Very few psychometricians have ever set their foot in a classroom after K-12. After high school, nobody wants to go back to high school. <laughs> But psychometricians would learn a lot by spending some time in classrooms. Um, and then there are technical advisory committees. I, I made a comment of this and, and I, I love technical advisory committees. It's how I met Kristen uh, and every technical advisory committee she's been in charge of, uh, I've been coerced to, to join. And I've learned so much. Uh, we, we talk about technical advisory committees among, the, among those of us that do this work in the measurement community as learning what's actually happening in practice. And yet we, we don't think about it as, a, as an opportunity to continually transform practice because technical advisory committee members play a role in essentially uh, endorsing practice. And we could be doing so much more, uh, those of us that, that sort of are on the circuit of, of working those technical advisory committees, and, and we could be playing a bigger role. A couple of ideas. Are there people that you think are stakeholders who are missing from those technical advisory committees? <laughs> so once again, I, you know, I, we often have this debate. We, we often talk about politics and about legislation and about community context. And then somebody will say, well, we're a technical committee. <laughs> Just show us the numbers. And technical advisory committee processes are very expensive and they're time consuming, but yeah, I think we're losing out because of our, our solitary focus on the technical aspects of test development. And we're not as collaborative as we could be. And, and I think we're, we've lost ground because of the lack of collaboration and because of the segmented process of test development. Community members, I mean, somebody <laughs> should be on the technical committee, not just the technical folks. And, and good technical, technical committees are able to find folks that bridge multiple roles. Right, and, and Richard just wrote yeah. in chat that NCEO recently combined their tech group with their stakeholder group, which might be an interesting approach. Jennifer, do you wanna add a little bit to this question three? Well, I was just, when I was thinking about Michael talking and you know, the, the groups are technical and I think technical advisory committees so often focus on the after, like after the administration, what did you see after you've already done all this work, basically, You've already traumatized these children. Let's see what it looks like on this end. Um, and it would be fantastic if they could be re-envisioned in a way to spend some time thinking about the before. And, and to me, I think that's where these other stakeholders would really have an impact to really thinking about the assessment design. Um, let's get these community members in this space and, and try to do as little harm as possible and then take a look at the after. And Kristen, I saw you nodding in agreement to that comment. Do you wanna expand upon that in terms of thinking before versus after? I was, yeah, I agree with that. I was also just trying to formulate what I think would be helpful on tax. It feels a bit redundant with what I've said before, but um, I'll give it another shot. Um, I, I think tax come in and, you know, tax are focused on helping the testing program make sure that they are not in violation of the standards, right? And so, um, if we could make space for the tax to have 
conversations, interdisciplinary conversations, which kind of goes to something in the chat and something Michael says as well. So that means thinking about who's at the table with the tack, but also pushing back against um, accepted notions. Uh, the one accepted notion that I've been, that's kind of been a mind blower for me uh, that I'm uh, relearning is that, uh, that our current notions of objective and neutral are um, actually objective and neutral, right? And so, um, you know, this conversation, Aaron, and you pushing me on this, on this question three, uh, has made me think that we need more space and more opportunity to have deeper conversations within our field and cross-disciplinary conversations um, that really challenge our, our own uh, our own definitions and our own thinking. And I, I, I've tried to make some space for that uh, where I work with our with the panel that Michael and, and Jennifer ha, are, are sitting on right now. Um, but I, I feel like um, I feel like maybe the, the, revi the revision of this book over the next couple of years is a place for that to happen and the work that Bob and others are doing in terms of trying to uh, you know, update or revise the, the UB guidelines. Uh, again, that felt a little bit redundant with what I was saying, but I wanted, wanted to put it out there. And, and you all have agreed that including students as stakeholders is something that's important. But we haven't really talked about how to include students and what you've heard from students in the past, what you expect to hear from students. Can someone talk about about that, about including students in the process? Yeah, let me let me say a few things. Um, when when I do uh, most of the work I do in schools, a lot of it I should say is is around classroom assessment. I really I love classroom assessment work, and I love working with teachers. Uh, and I, I talk with schools and school leaders and teachers, and I say, have you talked with your students? And they say, oh yeah, we, you know, we talk to our students every day, all the time. Not really. Most of the time they're talking to students. <laughs> and when they hear students, they don't really hear and, and understand. Uh, you know, we, we talk about student voice and the importance of student voice. And oftentimes people think that student voice is having those conversations with students. But we could look to students to be idea generators. Kid, you know, kids of all ages are full of ideas. They are bursting at the seams with ideas. If we could just harness their idea generating power, that would be amazing. Somehow we, we extract that from them. We extract so much from kids yeah. as they go through the K-12 system. But not only should, should youth be idea generators, they should be decision partners and help us make decisions. And then they should be implementers and help us implement the work that we're doing and, and this thing called teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and where we utilize youth power to generate ideas, help us make decisions and to implement teaching and learning, that's where I see the greatest gains uh, and the greatest power in, in, in any community. What's nice is robust definitions of formative assessment do include that explicit involvement of students in the learning and assessment process. Uh, but even for summative assessment, uh, one of the projects I mentioned very briefly before that we're working on with the University of Kansas, um, we're working on their alternate assessments, but we've been, been playing around with these co-design ideas of developing assessment tasks with students. Um, this particular work was done with students, not those with the most significant cognitive disabilities, but students who are underperforming in science. Um, and having them answer questions such as, well, how would you like to demonstrate you understand such and such concepts, for example, in the next generation science standards? What would give you the best opportunity to get engaged in this task of demonstrating what you know and can do? And so we'd uh, did these the co-design efforts and we just finished our first round of think aloud studies in cognitive labs and we're just analyzing the data now. But we're hoping that this will be the start of a trend 
of not assuming we know best right. for the students, because we don't. And I think this relates to the question that was in the chat too about how do you do this UDL in, in higher education? Um, because I have tried to implement some of these when I made a commitment to my courses being social justice courses. And what I have found is by the time we get them, Michael, as you implied, they have had so much beat out of them, so much agency removed from them, um, that it is a special exercise in hell to get them to even engage with me about around the question. I just want to make sure you learn something in stats. Anything you want to do, let's talk about how you could represent what you learn. And they, can't you just give me a paper? A paper they don't want to write, a paper they will bemoan about, a paper that won't be engaging, a paper that they hate, but they're just so accustomed to being told to do this thing that they can't even imagine showing me what they know um, in a way that represents who they are, what actually matters to them. So I think it's so critically important that we start doing the work when they are in elementary school, before we beat all of that agency out of them, all of that creativity out of them, um, all of the ways in which, um, before we make them feel like who they are and what they know is bad and should be ignored. So that, you know, when they show up to me when they're 19 years old, um, it doesn't become a two week exercise just to get them to realize all they bring to the table, all of that prior knowledge that they show up with, all of those cultural attributes um, that could be represented in a stats class. Um, it, it's really, a, it, it's become a struggle to, to even do it. And you would think it would be easier, but it, it really, it's not, it, it's really, quite hard to get them to that place and not for me to just break down and say, fine, do it this way and then keep it moving. Yeah, I was reflecting on this, this idea of, from what I hear from our new teachers that they're graded with, this is what we teach, this is how we teach it. Um, a young child draws a picture and the, an adult looks at the picture and says, oh, that's pretty, what is it? as though it has to be something. Can it just be an, a nice picture that I drew? And so because we're forcing the child to name it, to, to, that it has to represent something, right? Our box of what art is, we, we extract creativity from children by forcing them to define what it is that they're drawing rather than just allow multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation. I'm really loving these sort of multiple means concepts. Uh, starts early. It's, it's a, a little bit of a tragedy in, in my own family because when my oldest aunt and uncle started school, there was no more Spanish in the house because my grandparents didn't want trouble at school. We all regret that. The language was extracted. That's so hard to follow up on because it's such a big thing. Yeah, and you're getting a little bit of, of uh, support here in the chat, plus one to Michael. So I think now might be a good time to open it up to our audience for a little bit of question and answer. We are a small enough group that I feel like if you, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, please feel free to do so. And if you're more comfortable putting it in chat, that would be great too. Also feel free to use the raise hand tool if you feel like you're having trouble getting a word in edgewise. So if there are no audience questions, I'm gonna 
propose one that builds upon something Richard said earlier in the chat. And it's about you know, revisiting this broad summative assessment that we do every year. In light of the last year and a half because of COVID-19 and how everything has worked out, you know, do we have an opportunity to revisit this? And how do you see universal design for learning in assessment and, and instruction? How do you see how that can create this revolution that Jennifer was talking about or help contribute to it at least? Is there opportunity? Don't make me pick on someone. <laughs> uh, so you're you're talking about the end of the year state exams. Yep. The ESSA, the now ESSA school accountability exams. In my mind, assessments are designed for for, for a primary purpose. The, the thing is, is we hold schools and, and in some cases teachers accountable for an assessment that is designed at the state level. And so it's a natural thing for us to figure out how do we use that information to inform what I do in my own local place in the world. Um, I would prefer to focus on embedding UDL in more local assessments. Uh, even the interim assessments that are just perhaps a bit more frequent, a, a bit more tailored. Um, in, in Minnesota, perhaps more so than most states, we have a seriously decentralized education system. Uh, there's no state school board. Uh, school boards can pick their curriculum. And this is, you know, this is another kind of common misunderstanding among parents. The standards are not a curriculum. Uh, schools have to pick curriculum in order to deliver the standards, essentially. Um, if it were up to me and we needed to have school accountability assessments, and, and right now because of federal law, we're required to, schools should be getting scores, not students. It is a school accountability indicator. Schools should be getting scores. In the, in the same way that NAEP delivers scores to states, not to schools, not to students. In the same way that TIMS and P's and PEARLS deliver scores to countries, not to schools, not to students. I think the bang for the effort and the buck, because it's, it costs some money, time and effort uh, for UDL, is on those more frequent, more local controlled assessments, the ones that have greater potential to inform instruction. Greater potential. If I may share some thoughts, some of the host was nice enough to ask um, what my thoughts on this were. And earlier at the in the chat, I commented that when I first started grad school, this was something I got really interested in how universal design for learning could be tra transferred to assessment. Um, and frankly, I haven't seen it used nearly as much as I was hoping because I still see very much of a divide where a the framework is on accommodations where the student needs to have the IEP and have an entirely different um, testing environment so that they can best experience the test for them. Whereas when I got really excited about universal design for learning, it was based in the flexibility that the students can have what will work for them and they don't necessarily even um, you know, need to have a diagnosis to use it. And well, this is the first time I'm saying this publicly, but I have ADHD, but I never got any accommodations um, for any tests I've ever taken. And, um, but a lot of the environments are pretty, pretty stringent, you know? And so the idea, what when I first got into universal design for assessment, 
was that it would, wouldn't be each student applying for accommodations for their disability, that it would be that these things were available for everyone and it might help um, everyone, especially students like me who maybe had an undiagnosed disability that could have benefited from these tools. Um, and so as much as I love the accommodations group, and of course that's still gonna be the thing, I would really like to um, the assessment community to be able to return to um, the concept of just like flexible design that anybody um, could use. I mean, and this goes back to the thing with, with curb cuts. Yeah, it's meant for wheelchairs, but people pushing strollers use it too. Um, and I think that that, in my opinion, is one of the most underutilized um, but that possible benefits that universal design for learning and assessment provides. I, I want to hear what the panelists have to say, but I just will say that we we still so much have an accommodation retrofit mindset in the testing. And it, as you've heard, it starts all the way up at the level of the standards. Um, we can't fix these problems at the end. We, we can't. We can try, but we can't. At the same time, it, when I one of the things that's always perturbed me about universal design for learning is there's a lot of options there and it can be overwhelming for the students to know which of the multiple means of representation or which of the multiple means of responding are the most appropriate ones. So we have to start building students' metacognitive skills and letting them helping them learn themselves as learners so they can make effective choices in instruction and in testing. Um, and yeah, and, and it, we're just locked. As long as we're deciding after the fact, oh, you get this accommodation, we're never giving them the opportunity to develop this awareness of themselves. So we've we got to stop this log jam somehow. And, and I think one of the places we can stop it is with getting out of this retrofit slash accommodations mindset on testing. It's good to hear you say all that. Yeah, I agree. Other thoughts on this topic from panelists? Yeah, there's there's something I'd like to convey. I'm not sure if I have the 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 language in the right order here, <clears throat> but even among the the group that Kristen has pulled together with uh, Jennifer and a few others, uh, we don't always agree, uh, and we have we we bring different things to it. Um, and one thing that that really worries me is is how to actually do this. Um, how to how to tailor assessments that incorporate the idea of multiple representations and, and allow students to represent their knowledge and their practice and their understanding of, of a disciplinary subject matter uh, in a way that either the computer or the rater or the judge or the, the teacher who's scoring it recognizes it for knowledge and practice in a discipline, and and that's that worries me. Um, I I almost wish that in the same way that we have developed computer adaptive tests in order to tailor item selection to best estimate a person's location on a continuum, we could create a computer adaptive test to best identify a person's cultural and linguistic traditions and, and what they bring to the test and, and allow the test to encompass what, what students bring, to allow students to construct tasks that allow them to display disciplinary knowledge and practice. Hmm. There's, there's universal design to allow the test taker to construct a task that will allow them to display what they know and can do. I worry about that, Michael. <laughs> I hear you. I mean, I want, I want white suburban kids to read items from other perspectives, you know? So there is the social justice piece and there's, there, there are, there's a lot of work to be done, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? 
I have a good friend who just became superintendent of Rochester Public Schools. At his first school board meeting, they were overtaken by people who were complaining about indoctrination. Hmm. Why are we teaching kids critical race theory? They couldn't even conduct the board meeting. Local school boards pick their curriculum. I want to repeat a question here from Sam in the chat. Any, any suggestions on having teachers understand or see their own biases when they design assessments? Great question. Thoughts, panelists? Is it as simple as training? Is it something we need to cover in pre-service? Assessment yeah, that's, literacy? That's such a good question, Sam. Um, and I, I do think it has to happen in the teacher prep program, ideally. I mean, it's really about building one's critical consciousness Right. Um, and sometimes that can be difficult when you're already in the throes of teaching, not that it can't happen. And, then, and surely continuous professional development could do that. But we know the way most PD works in school is that you attend a workshop on the PD day, Wednesday afternoon, and then it's gone forever. Right. So and we know that that actually doesn't work, but we keep doing it. Um, and so pre-service programs, I think, is where we really have to begin to prep teachers to, to interrogate their own biases um, and, and to move towards that critical consciousness period, not just around designing assessments, right? Because it shows up in an instruction as well and, and, and white supremacy impacts everyone, right? Including teachers of color. So there's so much research out there about the importance of having teachers of color in, in classroom spaces and they are absolutely right. That, that's critically important. But I was a teacher of color and I also harmed students through my white supremacist assessment practices because I did not get training to develop my critical consciousness to recognize in fact what I was doing that I was just perpetuating those kind of colonial notions of what language and what communication looks like so um, I do think it has to start before a teacher steps foot in the classroom otherwise it's very difficult to do yeah Jennifer you made me think of a, a practice that I often recommend and that is when when teachers are developing assessment activities have another teacher look at it and that works especially well if you have diverse colleagues. And, and we, we never do this in higher ed. When a professor creates an assessment, you, you, don't, you wouldn't even think about asking another professor to take a look at it. You know, we, we're, we're too prideful in terms of our, our scholarship and our disciplinary expertise to have somebody critique our assessment. Wow, that's what we need to start doing. There's this phenomenon, I, I, I don't know if anybody's actually formally studied it, but we have this overconfidence that we can ask the right one or two questions to, to know if somebody understands something. We just tend to have this overconfidence. And it, yes, I think it's worse in higher ed where you know, a professor says, I'm gonna base my grade on just how you answer this one question and I've got my rubric and that's it. And it's so hard to convince people off of this. I don't know why this is, but it's a problem. And, and if we really embrace this multiple means idea, how better to achieve multiple means by, by collaborating, by having other people take a look at our stuff, our, our assessments, especially our key assessments. The assessments that really count. And this is where organizations that do this well, you know, they have their review committees. It, it's, and it's, 
perhaps not practical or functional to, to bring together those review committees. But I think that's where the real, real benefits can, can pay off. Yeah. I'm looking at the time. We've got about a minute left. So I want to close out uh, on time for folks who have other plans. I want to really thank the panelists today. You, you've been awesome. Thank you so much for spending so much time and effort today and at, a last, at the last minute joining up uh, with us on this. Um, this has been recorded. We're gonna be posting the video for this to the, uh, to the website, the UDL IRN website. It'll be our first of what we hope will be many more such uh, panel discussions. I'm also hoping to be able to get a transcript. I apologize for not turning on live transcription. That was an oversight on my part, but I am hoping that I can get uh, Zoom to automatically generate a transcript for this because there've been some really brilliant things said today and that are really important uh, for the future of assessment and for UDL and especially the UDL efforts to explicitly look at equity. So again, thank you very much. Thank you for the participants who've hung into the bitter end. And um, we're really grateful for this time today. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.